Hi, Dennis here. Welcome to Time Trip. In 1899, historians in China noted that pharmacists were selling dragon bones and that on the dragon bones there were all sorts of strange symbols. It turned out that these bones were more than 3000 years old and that the symbols on them was of the earliest fully developed Chinese writing system that has survived into our time. From those inscriptions we know that they came from the earliest undeniably documented Chinese dynasty, the Shang dynasty, and that those bones were used to communicate with the spirit world. More on that in a second. Archaeologists have found more than 34 towns of dragon bones in today's Anyang, which used to be the capital of the Shang dynasty. What's that? Apparently those weren't real dragon bones because dragons aren't real. What? Of course they are. Of course dragons are real. Haven't you seen The Hobbit? I'm trying to make this show interesting and now I have to tell you that those dragon bones actually came from turtles and oxen and so on. Oh. Anyway, they were used to know the future. A diviner would ask a question to the supreme god Shangdi or to some ancestor. Then the bones would be polished and heated under fire so that they cracked and from those cracks answers would be interpreted. The questions and sometimes also the answers would then be engraved on the bones in what we now call the oracle bone script. Many modern Chinese characters have their origin in the oracle bone script and some are a little bit similar but the oracle bone script was much much more pictographic than modern Chinese. And most characters are difficult for us today to read. So difficult that a museum has announced a reward of $15,000 for every single character to be deciphered. $15,000 a character? Who says humanities don't earn money? That's what I call a profitable translation job. We know from the bones that there was a distinct elite in Shang society who went hunting, waged war, fought in chariots and whose most important god Shang Di decided about harvest, military success, rainfall and whatever else was important. The nobility would also do rituals for the ancestors and offer them wine and animals. Bronze vessels played a huge part in these rituals. In fact, the largest and heaviest bronze ever excavated anywhere in the world World comes from the Shang dynasty. When a person died, one part was believed to go to another place. We don't know exactly where this was supposed to be, under the earth or in heaven, but we know that people believed that their dead ancestors could directly influence their daily life by protecting or harming them, and that you had to make sacrifices to appease them and to make sure the sacrifices were big enough. Sometimes they even sacrificed humans, probably prisoners of war, criminals or slaves, but also servants, who sometimes had to follow their king into his grave to serve him in his after life. Traditionally, the last king of the Shang dynasty is blamed for its end. He is said to have been very indulgent and to have built a lake of wine and a forest of meat. And whenever somebody said something like, dude, that's not okay, he would make them go, ah! Actually, no, it was worse than that. The story goes that he would use a fire to heat up a metal pillar and then would make that person hug that pillar and then use your imagination. Or no, maybe don't. Historically we only know that the Shang dynasty was conquered by the Zhou dynasty. Which is kinda boring I guess, but yeah. The Zhou was a feudal state, meaning that the king would keep control over his territory by giving titles to feudal lords, mostly his relatives, who would rule over parts of it. They gave up the idea of Shangdi and instead introduced the concept of the mandate of heaven. This means that the right to rule would be given to the king by heaven because of his supreme virtue. It would then be passed on to each successor of a dynasty. When a dynasty would become corrupt and indulgent, this would result in earthquakes and floods and peasant uprisings. I mean, it's almost the same, isn't it? So eventually, the dynasty would be overthrown by the next carrier of the Mandate of Heaven, who would establish his own dynasty, which would rule and rule and rule, until it would also become corrupt and indulgent and be overthrown by the next one, and so on and so on and so on. You get the idea. From the perspective of the common people, the good thing about this concept is that if a king sucks, they can overthrow him. The bad thing is that each time this had to be done, there had to be a civil war. 
We know from science that in 1059 BC, around the beginning of the Zhou Dynasty, there was a planetary conjunction of Mars, Saturn, Jupiter, Venus and Mercury. And it's quite likely that the founders of the Zhou Dynasty saw it as a sign to overthrow the Shang Dynasty and to establish the concept of the Mandate of Heaven as a new ideology. During the Zhou Dynasty, oracle bone divination continued to be practiced, but more often ink was used to write on the bones, and because ink doesn't lie Last that long, we can't read what they have written. But like the Shang, they left a lot of mysterious looking bronze, some of it with inscriptions. Jade was also an important material for ritual items and other things. It was associated with virtue, humanness and wisdom. And throughout China's history, many cool things would be made out of jade. We don't know quite exactly why the Western Zhou collapsed, and of course there is again a story about a stupid king who had fallen too much in love with a concubine, but in reality the main problems were probably economical. The Zhou government rewarded its officials not by a regular salary, but by irregular gifts, which included land. This in the long run wasn't a good strategy, because the more land the king gave to the officials, the less land he had left for himself. So at some point he simply wouldn't have enough land left to secure their loyalty, but at the same time he couldn't just stop giving land because the officials were already used to it. The system of giving land for loyalty must have been pretty successful at the beginning when land controlled by the king was still plentiful. And by the time this strategy reached its limits it was probably too late to reverse it. It resulted in the weakening of the center and when the center is weakened the feudal lords who used to be so loyal suddenly become very disloyal and all over the place small states start declaring independence until what used to be the capital is just one small state among many. So after the fall of the western Zhou, some of the old elites managed to evacuate to the east where they founded the eastern Zhou which lasted for 500 more years as one small state among many. This was the beginning of the spring and autumn period which for me is one of the most interesting periods in Chinese history and which we'll talk about next time. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more videos like this, subscribe to our channel and you can also help us make more videos by supporting us on the crowdfunding website Patreon. Thank you for watching Time Trip and I hope to see you again.